glad to have you here today, and uh, glad to have those. There's still people coming in, and uh, we're glad to have those that are joining us online. I'm trying to get myself situated here. I've got wires going every its direction and clips everywhere, and so who knows? My wife will straighten me out eventually. But uh, anyways, we're glad to have you guys here, and uh, we've got a song for you, Standing on a Holy Ground, Choir Hats.
Participated in, in that. In your bulletins, you've got a let's eat dinner together Wednesday fellowship dinner at 6:30. Okay, it's a little slip of paper, and it's coming up very quickly. Mr. and Miss Harrison, you want to tell us about the, the di upcoming dinner? Yes, it's going to be the day after Valentine's, so if you don't check your Valentine's dinner on Valentine's, you can bring them to this dinner, and you'll probably still make like up. <laughs> Very good. So 
Wednesday night, the 15th of February at 6.30, we'll have a family fellowship supper here in the, in the annex, and you just, just come on, all right? And uh, you'll have a great time with the lasagna and that. It'll be a great, great time as well. But before that, on the, on the 14th of that morning, on Tuesday at 7 a.m., we've got the Men's Community Prayer Breakfast at Cracker Barrel, okay? That'll be in Tallahassee. Come on. We have a great time there. We're in the back area there. We've got probably about 20, anyway, we've had 25 folks there sometimes, right, Brother Bill? And 20, some folks are there from all over Tallahassee. You come, and we have a great time in God's Word, and we get you out. We've got folks that come and go to work right afterwards. We'd love to have you come and be a part of that as well. I've got this note. It says, save the date, March 2nd, 6.30, drop-in baby shower for first option care. It's from Candy. She's going to have a list of needs soon. And just so if you're not really sure, where did Candy go? She's in the nursery. She's in the nursery. She's listening on the nursery. So she's at, got that going on, and uh, that'll be a blessing as well. Um, Wednesday night, we have a wonderful time. You know, we've got a great group. We've got, I'll be in here this Wednesday night speaking. You do have a pastor on Wednesday night, but I've been over yonder, and uh, we had, what, how many, 11 kids on Wednesday night uh, in our group, the Olympian group, and uh, do you pull up the church website, Keith? I know I didn't throw that. Oh, did we get those other pictures on the announcements? Yeah. Okay, good, yeah, okay, so we'll get, pull up the church website. Uh, you see that? That's the church website right there. there. Okay, there! This is Wednesday night. From Wednesday night, you know. Jason, do you see yourself right there? Brayden, do you see yourself? All right. I, Dylan, do you see yourself there? This is what we're doing in Paul Burt's classroom. That's why it's a mess in there every day. No. All right. But uh, this is our group on, on the Olympians. And uh, I didn't get a picture of the, the youth. They had just a... A, a big group, I don't know, you have about 20, 25 kids there in the youth on Wednesday night as well. But uh, this is the groups that we have on Wednesday night. We have a great time. We played kickball, and uh, then we came in and had a great lesson in God's Word. If you want to be a part of that and help out, just come. And that, what are the, Show me the other pictures we got. Jeffrey and Sydney. You know the guy on the left there? That's Jeffrey Basford, and Sydney, is, I believe, is just behind him there. And they are on... A, they're missionaries. Can you imagine being a missionary in the Amazon? And this is what it's like. Amazing. They're going upriver a couple of hundred miles, Jeffrey said, and uh, they are going to visit some of the villages upriver. And uh, I, I had this thought that he was just driving his boat upriver. So it's glad to know that they're not driving his just his boat upriver with the, their team. They're going upriver there. And they're going to share the gospel. And they are using many of the items that we purchased as a church for them to communicate and to, to reach people on the Amazon River. Yes? I thought you were going to read what his mom said in your message. Oh, I don't have that. You what did she that? say? Well, they uh -huh. can't communicate with them at all during this village that they're going to indigenous people. But the garment that we provided allows them to live track them. So the, pro the thing that we bought them, remember that the Garmin, they're tracking Jeffrey and Sydney and they can communicate by text over that Garmin, I believe as well. So they are going upriver. And so as you sit and think about it, pray for them over the next couple of weeks. That's what they're doing, all right? Let's be a prayer partner with them and lift them up in prayer as they, they share the word of God and the Amazon indigenous people there. Amen. I'm going to ask the men to come forward for the morning ties of gifts and offerings. And I want you to be thinking about your faith promise. Go ahead and put that in. I think we are at, um, after last Sunday, we are at like $180 a month for Raymond, which is amazing. Which is amazing. So if you've got any more of those, just slide them in the offering plate. And we'll keep those updated on the screen. Brother Wayne, will you... Uh, Bless the offering this morning. Our great Savior and the Father, we come to you this morning, Lord, just thank you for the blessings of being present this morning. Lord, we just thank you for Calvary Baptist Church and what it means to us, Lord. We just thank you for this time together that we can come and just sing these songs of praise and worship one with another. Lord, we just thank you for 
the missions of Calvary Baptist Church, and we just thank you, Father, Father for our outreach and the Amazon and uh, in the Philippines. Lord, we just pray that you could just, we could just be a, a witness to you through our church here in Calvary and also abroad. Lord, we just uh, ask you to just be with the, each member that's here this morning, Lord. Just open our heart to receive the blessing that's uh, in store for us through our, our message this morning. We just thank you, Lord, for our pastors. He's standing before us, Lord, and we just pray that you just give him the words that you would have him to speak. Lord, now as this offering that we're about to receive, we just ask you to just take it and bless it. Use it for ongoing of thy kingdom, and we give you the praise, honor, and glory for it all. In Christ's sake, amen. <laughs> Tell them about C-A-T that's in the license plate. 
and they catch that guy. He's gone to jail. Well, y'all think ah, the story's over till about two months later. And they say, we're going to court because this guy is saying he's not guilty. And you know who the witnesses are? Y'all, y'all are the witnesses. And the reason you're the witnesses is because you saw everything. So look, you have to put your hand on the Bible. Whoop, just a minute. Y'all come up here. Put your hands on the Bible. Put your hands on the Bible right now. All right, this is what they said. Do you swear that this testimony that you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. 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 Exactly. You can't be laughing. You can't. you got to be serious in the courtroom. So, you look, y'all are telling the truth. Now, the reason y'all are the witnesses, y'all saw it firsthand. Do y'all need to be scared? No. All you got to do is be truthful. If you tell what really happened, then this witness thing is not a bad thing at all. Let me go ahead and tell you who had that same problem. The disciples that lived on earth the same time Jesus did, they witnessed everything too. They saw it with their own eyes. And Jesus died on that cross and they saw him die on that cross and then he came back. Well, he came back and when he came back, the disciples were like, I can't believe this. I saw him die on the cross. And they said, is this really Jesus? And Jesus said, well, look, I got bones, I got flesh, and look, give me some fish to eat. And Jesus ate some fish. He said, can a ghost eat fish? No, I am really Jesus. And he told them this, and it's in the Bible. Just a minute, let me get it. Luke 24, 46 through 48. Luke wrote, he told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And since the disciples witnessed it, they were to go tell everybody. And now that we know, we're supposed to be witnesses too. Now should you be scared about telling things that you know? No. You know how God has changed your life. You know that when you ask Jesus to come into your heart and that you, how he has changed your life. So your job as a Christian, or when you become a Christian, is to tell others what you know. To be a witness of God's love. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that Jesus came to take away our sin and give us eternal life. Help us to be faithful witnesses about what he has done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, y'all get to go Okay, out. I'm going to let you remain sitting on this. Uh, he, if you'll just cue us up one verse. <laughs> he, just give us one verse, okay? Here we go.
awesome job on that. She did great. She said it real quick there. Let me ask you a question. You just got your mind going on being a witness, and I'm real loud right now. All right. How do you know that people walk down the moon? Come on, talk to me. How do you know that people walk down the moon? You what? You saw it on television. How many of you saw them walk on the moon on television? Raise your hand. How many of you didn't see them walk on the moon on television? There's a few of us. All right. Well, we, we got saw it on TV. All right, I've got another question for you. How do you know that the pilgrims landed on what we know would be America? <laughs> you saw it on TV? I don't know about that one. All right. <laughs> They didn't have TV back then. Good in. He was there. Oh, okay. <laughs> you got a lot of great help here, Gene. Uh, we we know about it. There might be some paintings of it or that. There were some people that were there. Okay, witnesses, and they recorded it in scripture. All right. How do you really know that the Braves won the World Series last year? How many of you didn't know the Braves won the World Series last year? How many of you forgot? How do you really know the Braves won, Wex? It was on TV. Okay, all right. Uh, let me go another one. How do you actually know that, you know, I think there was this conspiracy. I, I think the Gators won the national title. All right. How do you know that Georgia really won? They had 80,000 witnesses there. Were any of you there? So you don't really know. They could have just put it on TV. All right. No, there was witnesses there. You saw it on TV as well. All right. If you're not sure, just Google it, right? And check it out, right? Because Google's got the truth, doesn't it? Yeah, all right. Tongue in cheek there. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And then we're going to go to Acts chapter 1. But 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You see, the foundation of our faith is found in a historical event. The resurrection of Jesus from the grave. It's important. That is an important piece of history. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14, Paul was talking here. says, and if Christ be not risen. Okay, he's giving us an if situation. If Christ did not rise from the grave, then our preaching is vain. Your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that He raised Christ, whom He raised not. If so be that he, the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and we are yet in our sins. Did you catch that? We, didn't, we weren't there to see Christ raised from the grave, were we? Not even Gene was there, okay? We weren't there. But we have witnesses. We have credible witnesses that were there and attest to the fact that Jesus raised from the grave. Amen? And we believe them. And if Christ did not raise from the grave, then we are dead in our sins still. And there's no hope for us. You know, how do we know that Columbus sailed the ocean blue? Okay. <laughs> well, there was eyewitnesses there, right? How do we know that Jesus rose from the grave? Because of the credibility of the witnesses that were there, that saw that. Luke begins the book of Acts, and he begins by assuring Theophilus that Jesus presented himself alive. That's important. Jesus presented himself alive for 40 days on earth after the resurrection. Now he wants to show that these men were godly men of integrity whose witness we can trust. You see, 
Our faith is founded upon the fact that Jesus rose from the grave. Amen? That's a great place to say amen. Amen? Amen. Yes. Christianity is credible because it is based on the witness of these apostles, these men of integrity. If you jump down to Acts chapter 1, verse 12, it tells us here in verse 12, Then they returned. Jesus has just ascended into heaven. And they stood there gazing, and the angel said, Why standing? Go! And Jesus had told them to go unto, to, back to Jerusalem and wait for the promise. Verse 12, Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they went into the upper room, where both, both Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, Zelotus, and Judas, the brother of James. These folks gathered in this upper room. And what makes them a credible witness? Well, our passage here, verses 12 through 26, gives us five qualities of these men, these folks that were there, that stand out. The first one is that they fully believed in Jesus as Lord. The apostles spent three years living with Jesus. They saw him when he was tired. They saw him when he was hungry. They saw him arrested, mistreated, finally crucified. They affirmed that he was fully man, and they affirmed that he was fully God as well. Look at verse 21 in chapter 1 here. It says, Wherefore of these men which have accompanied with us all the, the time that the Lord Jesus, when, when Peter talks about the Lord Jesus here, he's saying, Lord, and that's the same word as God, the Father. Did you catch that? He said, Jesus who was here is God. The one who spoke the earth into existence. He affirmed that he was truly God. Not only there. Remember when in John chapter 20 verse 28. Thomas the doubting. He's, he's constantly told as he's the doubter. But he exclaimed to the risen Jesus in, in verse 20. He says, my Lord and my God. He expounds upon that. He says, you are my Lord and you are God. And then Jesus talked to him in verse 29. John 20, verse 29 says, Because you have seen me, you've believed. Blessed are they who did not see and yet believe. Did you catch? That's who we're talking about here. Okay. we got somebody's thing going off here. All right. There we go. I think we got it. But... Maybe that's me talking. Who knows? I'm lying. But he says here, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are those who have not seen. We haven't seen Jesus, have we? And yet we believe that he's God. Although we don't have much historical information on most of the apostles, we have enough to say that their lives were dramatically changed. Not just them, the people that were there as well that experienced Jesus. There's a book called 12 Ordinary Men. And they will, I would urge you, we actually preached through it a number of years back. All right, 12 Ordinary Men. And um, it's a great book by Brother John MacArthur on the disciples. I would highly recommend you to read that. Jump into it. But Peter himself declares after the, catching the miraculous catch of fish, he fell before Jesus in Luke chapter 5. He says, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. He recognized him as Lord right there, as God. You know, Matthew had been a wealthy tax collector, and he lived in a comfortable life, but he gave it all up and turned to God. These disciples, their lives were radically changed because of Jesus. Look at verse 13, chapter 1, verse 13. And when they were come in, they went into the upper room. We're about all these folks here, okay? And then down to verse 14. Jump down the verse. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, with his brethren. 
in the midst here. Here are these folks that are there, not just the disciples, the apostles, that would soon be the apostles. There was, there was about 120 people there. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there as well. This is the last reference to Mary in the Bible. You know, you can speculate a lot outside of God's word. But here, what's written in God's word is Mary, the mother of Jesus, was in this upper room and she believed that Jesus was God as well. Did you catch that? These, these folks didn't come together and pray to Mary. They were praying to who? They were praying to God. All right? He goes on. There's no biblical evidence that, that Mary was elevated above any other believer that was there. It's implicit by her being present here that she believed that Jesus was her Savior and her Lord as well. Not only that, we see Jesus' brothers were here who had not, not believed in him just a few months before. In John chapter 7, verse 5, we have James here, the brother of Jesus, the stepbrother of Jesus. That, you know, he appeared to his half-brother James in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 7, which led to his conversion. He must have gone back and told his other brothers they were here in the upper room as well. The point is that these people that gathered here, the, the apostles, the disciples, these, these, these ladies that were, were servants of God as well, they, they gathered here because they had a dramatic change take place in their life because of their personal relationship with Jesus Christ. They had affirmed that he was Jesus, the Son of God. And they believed it. Secondly, we see in verse 14, these folks that were here not only believed that Jesus was God, they were committed to obedience and prayer. It says here in verse 14, these all continued with one, with one accord in prayer and supplication. They were, why were they gathered in this upper room? Why did they go and do this? Well, it's because Jesus told them to, right? He said, go and wait for the promise of the Father. Is waiting easy to do? Talk to me. Is waiting easy to do? No. Miss Carolyn, when you're sitting there waiting for the, the fish to bite, is it easy to wait? No. Honey, just drop in the dynamite today, okay? And he, he does, and that's why he comes back with all those fish, okay? No, he doesn't do that. Waiting is not easy. It's not easy to wait, and yet they were supposed to wait. All right. They had, they, you, you sit and think about the things that were going through their mind. In Jerusalem, it was not a friendly place for them. They were on the, people were on the prowl looking for them. Folks, listen. Maybe they, 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 they came back and they waited. They waited because Jesus told them to. Why did they wait? They wanted to have the promise of the Father. They wanted to receive the promise of the Father. So what did they do while they waited? They gave themselves to prayer, it says in verse 14. They waited and they prayed. We're waiting the return of Christ, are we not? And what can we do while we wait? Get busy and pray and do God's work. We can pray just like they did. What were they praying for? It doesn't really tell us what they were praying for here. Maybe they were praying for the, the, the Spirit, the promise that was going to come. Obviously, they were praying for wisdom as well, as we'll see in the next section. These men, these folks, were committed to obedience and prayer. And that's why we can trust their, their witness about the resurrection. Thirdly, we see in verses 15 through 20, they committed themselves not just to prayer, they committed themselves to the word. In verse 15, in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of them being about 120, says, men and brethren, the scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David. Oh, where did you think he was reading when he said something about David? You help me out. Where was he reading? What book of the Bible? Probably the Psalms, right? He was in Scripture. 
He said, which David just spake concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus, for he was numbered with us and obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field in the reward of iniquity, and he fed, fell headlong, it says, and he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch as that the field is called in their proper tongue, I can't pronounce it, Esladama, all right, that is to say the field of blood, for it is written in the book of the Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric or his office let another take. Peter had been spending time in God's word. They had been spending time in prayer. And you have to stop and remember, what did Jesus do in those 40 days? He expounded to himself from the scriptures, all the things that had taken place and what was, were going to take place. And so what did they do? They get into God's word. And here, that's what Peter's doing. He's preaching here. He's giving off a message. And he quotes from Psalm 69 and Psalm 109. And what did they want to do? They wanted to understand more in depth what God was trying to tell them through Scripture. And while they did this, it came to their forefront that they had to do something about Judas. This is the only account in Scripture that tells us what happened to Judas, besides what Luke had shared at the end of his uh, gospel. And it tells us what took place. But you can tell that they were they struggled with this. They, they were think, sitting there thinking, okay, how could somebody follow Jesus and do this stuff? How could God allow such a thing to happen? And so what did the apostles do? They went to prayer and they went to scripture to find help with these difficult situations. They devoted themselves to God's word. That's why Paul, Peter says in verse 16, the scripture must needs have been fulfilled. The word here, had, is the one that Luke uses often to refer to divine necessity. Jesus had to suffer. The scripture had to be fulfilled. And he says this is where the scripture was, and this is where it was fulfilled, right here. Folks, listen, how important is it for us to spend time in prayer and spend time in God's Word? If the early apostles and the, and the disciples saw that it was important and imperative to spend time in God's Word and to study it and to learn about it, it ought to mean that much to us as well. I hope that you spend time in God's Word daily. I hope that you pray daily. Peter applied these verses in Psalm 109 and in Psalm 69. He applied them to the situation that they were dealing with right there in the first church, okay? Right there in the Jerusalem. What do they do? They teach us that we ought to go to God's word with all the difficulties that we encounter. Understand this. They had the Psalms. They had these other manuscripts. But we have God's Word here, do we not? We have all the precious promises in God's Word that we can cling to. We can take things right directly to the throne room of God. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 to 16 tell us what a tremendous blessing that is. We have God's Word. Folks, when you have difficulties in life, like these early believers did, they went to God's word and they looked for direction. Not only that, we see in verse 21, not only did they get into prayer and into God's word, they were careful witnesses of the Lord. Look at verse 21, he says, Wherefore of these men, which have accompanied it with us all this time, that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from one of us, from us, must be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And they appointed to Joseph, called Barsabas, who is surnamed Justice, and Matthias. They were careful witnesses. As Miss Sherry shared with us, good witnesses 
don't invent stories. They truthfully tell us exactly what they have seen and heard. How do you know that Georgia won? You saw it and you heard it. How do you know that Atlanta won? Well, you, you can go back and you can check and you, people saw it. They were there. They witnessed it. Good witnesses don't invent stories. They tell exactly what they have seen and heard. These folks that were there are witnesses. They shared what they had seen. They shared what they had studied in Scripture. And they shared that as well. So what did Peter do? He set forth the qualifications for replacement for Judas. And he says, listen, somebody that's going to step up to this position, they need to have been with us from the beginning. What does that tell you? That there was other people besides the apostles that followed Jesus. And they were there. And they witnessed that. What a blessing that is. <coughs> One commentator wrote this and made a, a, a comment, said this, Alexander McLaren said this, he said, points out that you cannot prove that a thing has happened by showing how desirable it is that it should happen or how reasonable it is ex to expect that it should happen or what good results would follow from believing that it did happen. All of this is irrelevant. The only relevant question is, did it happen? Did it take place? Did it or did it not? And our witnesses were careful with God's word. And they said, yes, Jesus rose from the grave. He rose to heaven. And they witnessed it. It's to this historic, life-changing event that we cling to, amen? Because they witnessed it and they shared it with us. Not only did they do that, they were careful. They didn't just make up these stories. They didn't just dream this up. They weren't out there for their own furtherance to, to promote themselves. They were a witness to God's word and the actions that were there. And lastly, we see that they submitted to God's will. They were looking for a replacement for Judas. In verse 24, and they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men. I'm going to stop there for a minute. I don't even have this in here. It just came to mind here. Peter's making this prayer. And what did Peter just do not too many days earlier? He denied the Lord, did he not? And remember that interaction by the, the seashore? And Peter said, the Lord said, Peter, do you love me? And he asked him, do you love me three times? And it was like, yes, Lord, I love you. Yes, Lord, I love you. Lord, you know all things. You know the loves in my heart. And Peter's praying here and he says, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men. He's saying, Lord, you know my heart. He's coming and asking God for what? Direction. You know the hearts of all men. Show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship, which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. My sister-in-law, Heidi, walked up to got two young kids in their family. Uh, I, can't, I couldn't remember all the different names. They've got like seven kids. Is it seven kids? Yeah, seven kids. All right. Levi and, uh, and uh, what? 
Ezra, Ezra, I'll call them Ezra, Nehemiah, Levi, Ezra. Well, they, they were throwing some dice in the dryer and hitting it on and going around in circles in there. And, and uh, Heidi walked up to them and said, what are you guys doing? <clears throat> they said, we're casting lots. They must have heard the story about casting lots, okay? And, uh, you know, they, the, the, the apostles, they didn't do best two out of three. They asked God to direct them, and he did. He gave direction, and they submitted to God's will there. So how can we apply this to our life? I want you to stop and think. In a jury trial, the attorneys are trying to discredit the adversary's witness. If they convince the jury that their opponent's witnesses are, are questionable, they can win the case. And we are in a world today, folks, where people are saying, you know what? That didn't take place. And they question the credibility of the witnesses that were there. Just like I said, you know what? Florida won the state, the, the national championship. I'm questioning it, okay? There are people today that are doing that. We need to be confident in what we believe about God's word. We need to be confident in the understanding the credibility of the witnesses the truthfulness of these witnesses that were here. God wants us to know that our faith is credible. It's something solid that we can stand on. It's not just a hope we have in our heart. It's a truth that we can stand on. It's a foundation that's firm. It's not based on religious speculation. It's based on the historical resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead who people witnessed. That event proves he is God and everything else follows it as well. Since he is God, he is worthy of our praise. Since he is God, he is holy and just. Since he is God, he is worthy of our following him. We know that the resurrection is true. Why? Because of these godly witnesses. They didn't profit from their witness. In fact, most all of them lost their lives because of their witness for God. They were just simply servants who laid down their lives for the sake of the truth of the gospel. I would hope and pray that we have people here today that are willing to sacrifice for the witness of God as well. We stop and we sit and think, well, what we have to do this week, A, B, C, D, I go to work, I go to school, blah, 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 it's homework, blah, blah, blah. and then we think about a witness for God after the fact. Matthew six thirty three. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Put God first in your life. These these witnesses that were there believed and gave themselves wholly to the task at hand. Yet there were some people that were in their midst, Judas one, who ignored the evidence and followed his own selfish desires, did he not? Because that's what's that in front of us. We have a choice to make, do we not? just like Judas and just like the others that were there. Do we accept the, uh, the apostles' witness? Do we accept these witnesses and their, and their witness as true and follow Christ holy, or don't we? 
Do we follow Christ just because it's something that's good to do and makes us feel good? Or do we follow Christ because it is real and it's factual? That's your choice to make. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father, thank you for your love. And thank you for your grace. Father, thank you for the witness and the truth that we find in your word. We find that your word is factual. That it can give direction in our life. With heads bowed and eyes closed, let me ask you a question. Maybe you're here today and you realize that God's word is factual. It's true. Why not come to him? Why not say, okay, Lord, I believe that you came. I believe that you died on the cross. I believe that you were buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Why not come to him? Why not? Maybe God is working on your heart. Maybe he's leading you. I want to urge you to come to him. Father, as we continue in prayer, I ask that if there's someone here listening or in the congregation that finally sees that your word is true, factual, that they will come and believe and trust by faith in their life. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to look up here. Our invitation song is not an invitation song today. But if God's worked in your heart, I want you to, to come. But I also want this invitation to be an encouragement to you that we don't stand on a feeling. We don't stand on, you know, what this guy says. We stand on the promises that are found where? In God's word. And I want you to understand as you step out this week, I want you to stand firmly, as Ephesians 6 says, stand on the truth of God's Word. Your faith is real. Your faith is not in vain, no matter what happens around. Though the mountains be removed and be cast in the sea, guess what? God's Word will stand. Amen? So I want to sing, standing on the promises, all right? God's worked on your heart. You come as we sing. Let's stand together and sing this song of faith. Standing on the promises, my King, through eternal ages, let His praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. of God my Savior standing standing I'm standing on the promises of God next verse let's see it out standing on the promises that cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear us stay by the living word I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Did you catch that, folks? That's what those folks stood that day. And then they went out and faithfully stood on God's promises. And we can do the same. Amen? amen. Great time to say amen. Amen? Amen. amen.
Brother Lex, in close some prayer this morning. Lord, we thank you for this faith, Lord, that you can only give us, Lord, to, to stand on the faith that we know that you are Lord and, and witnesses were there and to see that you rose the third day and, and now that all, all that you promised us has come to pass, Lord. We just thank you for that. You never fail us, Lord, and we look forward to your coming, Lord, again and, and um, fulfilling all the promises, and we know you will one day. We thank you, Lord, for that. We thank you for giving us hope today, even, and uh, for those that maybe are sick, Lord, we pray for them and lift them up, Lord, maybe have tests and um, things going on in their lives, Lord. Just, we pray, Lord, that, that you would take care of that and just give them hope in that, that they can trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.